You know what time it is. It's time for another episode of the Jungle Gyms Podcast. I'm your host, Mark. Welcome to the show. As always, thanks all of you out there getting those audio downloads up. There's so many of you out there, and I'm trying to convert you all to also be YouTube people for me. But that's okay. YouTube's doing pretty good recently for us, too. We had a nice milestone recently. So for all of you who have subscribed to Jungle Gyms on YouTube, thanks. I appreciate it. You're making me more viable all the time. You know, we're this is the, the 102nd episode. I've been doing episodes. They've all been for you the whole time. And then I got a great opportunity to interview somebody that I have been personally interested in for 20 years. Uh, and so, yeah, we don't do a ton of food on this one. But, you know, how am I going to do this? This is, this is a gift for me. So this week on the show, I'm bringing in Andy Merrill. Andy came in a while back, actually. We've been in contact for like a year about doing this in the first place. Came in months ago for me. Uh, Andy, you may know, um, he is like one of the founding creatives at Adult Swim for a Cartoon Network. Um, a big driving force behind things like Space Ghost, Coast to Coast. Uh, you will probably best recognize him as the voice of Brack, uh, who is a very popular character for a lot of us that grew up in that time. Listen, it was an honor to do this, and I've since got to hang out with him a couple times. So thanks, Andy. I appreciate you. And thanks for doing this. <laughs> We talk about so much stuff. I mean, everything we cover, Andy's life, you know, the experiences at Adult Swim. Uh, we talked for hours and I tried to get this down. And thanks to my friend Zach for the help on this one. We tried to get this down in somewhat manageable length, uh, you know, because we were talking about, we got off topic forever talking about our mutual appreciation of holiday uh, animated specials, predominantly the Rankin Bass variety, you name it. There's so many fun things. Uh, but before I dive into the Andy interview, of course, I just want to remind you of some upcoming events here. Um, Again, I keep mentioning this, but the International Wine Festival tickets are on sale now, so you can come drink a bunch of wine with me, and Lucky will be there, and I'm sure we'll be bringing plus ones. You know the drill. That's always a fun time. Uh, it was a great festival last year, uh, honestly, and if you're thinking about it, VIP is definitely worth it, too. Chef James and Chef Logan are killing it over there in the Oscar event kitchen. I think that's what they're calling that space that they're cooking in. Uh, whatever, but they cook for the Oscar event center as well as the Oscar station, so if you've ever eaten any of the food that we make in-house here, and you're like, oh, my gosh, it's so good. Well, it's because of Chef James and Chef Logan. So thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, but that you get some extra action that way with the VIP tickets. And with the regular tickets, you still get to taste all kinds of wine, although there's some that get reserved for VIPs only, which, you know, if you're a wine person, and I'm trying to be a wine person, I'm slowly trying to become a wine person, a bourbon person, maybe a cigar person, all of those things. I just want to learn everything and touch it all as much as I can. Uh, and I like to do that with all the experts teaching me. So anyway, that's coming up here in November. That's our next big festival. Actually, you know, there's one. I can't tell you anything about it lately, but or not lately. I can't tell you about it yet, but I got to pitch a fest recently, and I think it was fairly warmly received. Pretty excited about that. Yeah, so we're going to see. I mean, obviously, it's like very much... If you've ever been in these situations, don't get too excited yet. It's kind of where I'm going with this. But like, you know, you go and you're like, hey, I have this idea. What do you think? And when people are like, actually, that sounds kind of cool. Let's do the next step. So that's about where I am. Uh, it's really fun. I have a very cool job here and I have a lot of really fun coworkers. And more importantly, you know, I was thinking about this. I was reading something on the Internet the other day. And people were talking about, uh, I, I, you know, it was one, I know what it was. One of my friends was complaining online. I'm assuming they might be in a weird place with their work right now. And I'm sorry, because that happens to a lot of people, especially those people who are in creative positions, uh, where sometimes you'll find that you'll get hired for a position. And then, uh, how did I put it? I was like, you get scapegoated, right? Because it's like just easy to be like, we're going to keep doing what we've always done without any change or thought for the future, but we want somebody to blame it on. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that I was like, wow, I've been really fortunate in like the last 10 years with this job, my last one and all my acting gigs. I have not run to that experience in quite some time. So first off, thanks, former and current employers. I really, really appreciate you. And I, I bring this stuff up on the show because I know a lot of people listen from all walks of life. And uh, listen, if you're an employer, man, trust these experts you bring on or don't bring the experts on. Like, I think it's a win-win. So I wasn't trying to get on my soapbox too much, but like, you know, I, I had a, I was on a podcast episode recently. Someone was like, what do you attribute the success here to? And I, one of the things I always think about like every day, especially every day I'm at work, is just that I work for somebody like Jungle who 
sees the vision in hiring experts and is like, go be the expert I hired you to be. And then it, it's only a problem if you turn out not to be the expert. And I feel like more business owners could learn this. More people in positions of power could learn this. I'm telling you. I don't think that we would have the success we had here if they wanted me to do a boring buttoned up show, right? I just don't think that's how it would have gone. I see the response on social media and stuff. Anyway, I, I, I'm mostly just trying to be thankful in a very long winded roundabout way. Uh, I'm sorry to my unnamed friend who is <laughs> at least writing posts that way. Uh, but thank you also for writing that post because it made me feel like, hell yeah, I really am in a good position right now. So uh, because I was in these kinds of good positions, that's how I was like, listen, I know this is predominantly a food show, but Andy, eh, we like the tie back. Andy lives somewhere nearby. I won't give all the specifics, but he shops the store regularly. And that was the connect. I was like, oh, you really do come here? And then he's like, yeah, I'm like not very far at all. So of course that's what I do. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, again, this is, you know, it's it was a really cool opportunity. So Andy, truly appreciate it. And everybody out there, if you're a fan of his, uh, do me a favor and start just writing in passion, please, to companies like Adult Swim, Cartoon Network. Let's bring Space Ghost back. It's like the perfect time for that. All these shows are getting rebooted. You know, Aqua Teen's coming back this year, all this kind of stuff. I and mean, again, huge fan. Uh, you, he was on Aqua Teen as well. Bring these shows back. Cater to the nostalgia. I, it's hard for me to get DVDs of every show I like. Just make new episodes. That's where I'm at with it. And on that, I got to introduce you all to Andy Merrill. Uh, I'm Andy Merrill. I uh, do cartoon voice work. I was Brack. I've been in various different shows like Adventure Time and Gravity Falls and the... Well, it's out now. Uh, Kiff is the name of the show. Andy, welcome to the show, though, for real. Yeah. I, this is so cool. I I mean, this is, I'll say this directly to the audience. This is the perk of just annoying people whose careers you've enjoyed on social media. You had me at Jungle Gyms. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> my, my, I, you know, go up through Cincinnati and my friend Wally at home is like, you got to go to Jungle Gyms. And I'm like, okay. And then I came here and it was like, okay, this is one of those cool places that sells a lot of crap. So, right. um, <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, <coughs> it's an accurate take on the store, honestly. It sells a lot of crap. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we're just, we're <laughs> chock full. <laughs> Don't, yeah, it's not Jungle Gems International Market. It's <laughs> jum, Jungle Gems World of Crap. I mean, look, it's, you've got an office board game. Yeah, I'm here. The one I actually want to play is the Pan Am airline one. I don't know what that's all about. Well, but. you know, is it is it is it Pan Am or is it TWA that has a hotel in New York now? I think sense. it's TWA, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, my but. ex-wife uh, went, stayed there when uh, she was in. She used to have to do like business in New York back and forth all the time. Yeah, she you know is at Paramount, not like not like you know, but. Um, yeah, they had just opened. I get it. it. Start and, by flexing, and, uh, us. and that was like the last, um, uh, the last night of her trip. You know, she stayed at the the Pan Am or TWA hotel and said it was just amazing, just the the way it was set up and all that. And I don't know why we're talking about this. In, <laughs> That's the beauty of a it, podcast. Just the pictures and stuff that she sent and and had just made it look so cool. All the uh, staff were dressed as like flight attendants and pilots. And, and oh, that sounds fun. Like that. And so, yeah, yeah. Damn, now we got to go. Yeah, we do. All right. Well, let's let me kill the recorder. <laughs> let's get on the plane. <laughs> we're taking this show on the road. Are you a foodie at all or are you just yeah. like fun oh, stuff? Yeah. Cool. What, yeah, are you yeah. in, what are you into? What are you into? Like, <laughs> do you like eating? I don't know. This is like the, a I'm, weird uh, first date. I, I, I'm into <laughs> anything. You know, I've been to, the, uh, you know, all these different places. Uh, I think the weirdest thing. Um, I want to say it was, you know, we were in Iceland. We had the, I had, I tried the fermented shark. Oh, how was that? Uh, it tasted like ammonia, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Uh, and you know, they, they don't give you a lot because <coughs> they know you're going to hate it. So, right. you know, they, it's just nostalgia anymore. It's not really a traditional Icelandic food. Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah they bring it out and uh i had one piece and it's just like uh just 
offensive to the senses. And then, <laughs> it's, but it's one of those things. It's like I can't. Let me have. Let me try that again. You just like it. You know, it ends up like not too long later, you've eaten the whole thing. Right. <clears throat> but they only bring you like five little pieces, so it's not such a big. Not like you're a glutton for <laughs> for, for fermented shark, but well, how uh, conveniently I did bring out a, bo- no, <laughs> a bottle of ammonia uh, to drink out of our adult so swim cups. It, yeah, that's what it tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a terrible trip. Imagine just trying to compare. All right, all right, here's fermented shark. Here's ammonia. Which one? But it tastes was this better? same like place uh, in Reykjavik that had this amazing lamb soup. Oh, mm, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I only did the shark once. But probably not again. But you did the soup again, But we kept right? going back for the lamb soup. Oh, yeah, it sounds it good. so amazing. Lamb underrated protein. <laughs> Icelandic lamb soup is... That sounds good. All right, anyone from Iceland out there, come really, out. Really, really, really good. Me and Andy need some soup. When you are doing these voices, do you, like, do you dive? Like, do, is this just something switch in your brain when you go full Brack or if you're going Oglethorpe or, you know... Most or, voices I do now, I have to... Uh, I'll, I'll like do a couple takes and if I just go like way overboard in the read I'll be like that's Brack and I'll have to like go back and think about it and do it again but Oglethorpe I've I've separated Oglethorpe and Brack so much that sure <laughs> it's easy you know I can go back and forth between them and not have either go into it but uh, Oglethorpe is different because he's like a full-on villain, and, and right. uh, I always have to be kind of. I'm always told when I start doing Oglethorpe to like kind of like lay back a little because because I tend to just come out screaming, you know. Of course, um, he's kind of a screamy character, though. Well, yeah, but <laughs> but most of the time it's like I'm going to get you, and then, and then like everybody's like, yeah, stop, you're gonna kill your voice, and. You got to work up to that. I am working up to it. <laughs> Just like yelling. <laughs> but you think I can get louder than this? And then it turns out I can't get louder than that. So. <laughs> like rein it in. All right, maybe not. Let it loose. Do you have a Do you have a favorite show you've ever worked on? Is that something I can even ask? I was always a big fan of uh, Adventure Time. Yeah. You know, when it when it came out, it just kind of blew me away, and I met Penn. Uh, Ward at uh, uh, a uh, Cartoon Network Christmas party. Oh, and, cool! Um, yeah, we got wasted. <laughs> but before that, you know, I was just talking about how much I love the show and all this stuff. And and you know, for the the first I don't know like half hour, he's just going, uh huh, yeah. Like I was just some <laughs> raving fan, which I was. And um, and then. Somebody, somebody mentioned something about. Somebody asked me something about Brack or something. I don't. I don't remember. <clears throat> and I, you know, ans- answered him, and 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 then I saw Penn's eyes just go, just make a total shift, <laughs> and it was like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so and so, you know, we found that we were like, you know, mutual fans. So. <laughs> Um, but it, yeah, it took like a half an hour to me to actually say, oh, oh yeah, uh, I, I do this show. I did that. Um, so then, then maybe, maybe like a, I don't know, maybe like a year later, maybe less than that. He had written, um, or Kent Osborne had written, um, James, I think Penn wrote it, uh, the episode is called James, and then there's James too, and right. then I can't remember the name of the third episode, but uh, it's it's like deep in the lore of like the eighth season, which right. is like James's last appearance. Um, but yeah, it's not James the James Baxter the horse; it's James the wafer cookie. I was going to say, yeah. I think he is. <laughs> that there. Uh, we got a picture off screen. We'll put yeah, it up on I, screen. I originally thought he was like an ice cream sandwich, but he's more like a wafer cookie. That makes sense. It's like a little Vienna finger. It's funny because yeah. I didn't know that. I thought he was an ice cream sandwich 
He's uh, like a naked Kit Kat. Oh, okay. A, a yeah, like a nutty bar. Oh, I'm into it without the chocolate. Yeah, I'm here for a naked Kit Kat. <laughs> that it's such a beautiful show, and there was so. I mean, it was. Uh, you mentioned the lore, and it's one of those. If you all haven't watched Adventure Time out there, you have to. I, I always have a fun story about that. I'd come back in from a vacation, and I went to a friend's house, and she goes, "Do you want to see my four year old niece's favorite show?" And I was like. No. <laughs> and then we watched, it was the episode with, it was from the first season. It was with the first uh, appearance of Neptur, the never ending pie throwing robot that Andy Melanakis, I think played. Yeah. Uh, and I was just like, there were so many jokes that I was like, all right, this is definitely. Yeah. It's it, insane. Yeah. I remember just watching. I'm like, did you write this show for me? But also this four year old <laughs> is the one that's telling me about it, you know? But you know, I like that, you know, there was some, even though it's all scripted and stuff, there was some, you know, kind of uh, individual creativity that they, you know, that I get to get away with. Um, like they didn't say we need this certain voice. Um, so I, I would give him, I gave him maybe four or five different versions um, of the voice to do. And, <laughs> The majority, the the one he was like emphatic on was the one where he was just like, <laughs> I I basically craned my neck up and laughed the whole time. I'm like, <laughs> do you like this? And <laughs> and that was like he just liked that. And James makes robot noises all the time whenever he moves. <laughs> so I didn't get to record with the cast, which. I think they often did. I had to record by myself because all of the noises that I um, yeah. had to make uh, would have distracted <laughs> from everybody. Um, and they couldn't have just done it after the record. That's one of the fun things about recording a character is yeah. that after the, um, I think they call it Walla, um, after you're done reading all the lines, they want to get every single type of, noise that they can get from you especially sure. if it's a new character so i need like belches or burps or sighs or or running or getting punched in the face or anything like that they get at the very end <laughs> so at the very end it's just weird because you've read the script and at the very end you're just going stuff like that I, you know, I was going to ask you about this too, because like we were talking before well, we were just strolling the store before about, you know, I, doing a lot of the commercial work and how it's like, there's obviously a lot of physicality when you're like an on screen actor versus like how much physicality is there for you when you're doing voice acting? Like I never, they always ask if I want to you know stand or sit and it's usually I, I stand because I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of body movement. Mm -hmm. Um, Elsewhere, if I'm sitting, I don't, I'm a lot more, you know, kind of relaxed and stuff. And I used to laugh at Don Kennedy, who was Tanzit in uh, Space Ghost Coast to Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Kennedy was an old uh, children's uh, TV show host in the 60s and 70s yep. in, in Atlanta. Watching him, <laughs> watching him in the studio, you just see this cute little old man just like tense up and go, I don't. <laughs> and just like, just like scrunch his body up and stuff. It's funny. Um, I later did like a live action thing in the early 2000s uh, for Cartoon Network. It was called Cartoon Fridays. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that we had Tara, who is the voice of uh, Bulbasaur amongst um, a lot of anime voices. And Tommy Snyder does a lot of acting. Uh, oh, cool. He was in uh, uh, Baskets and. Uh, oh, yeah, great shows. show. They hosted the show, and I did a puppet, uh, um, um, Long Haul the Puppet Trucker. I wrote Don Kennedy in this Cartoon Friday because <laughs> I had this <laughs> stupid idea to have a – it was just – we were just doing dumb segments. So Long Haul had his own segment where I had this puppet, and we had like a – uh, props department made this amazing semi truck that I had to squeeze my body up. Into oh my gosh. Head down highway 40. And, and, uh, 
Yeah, it was very Highway 40, but it was like, <laughs> it was more like uh, the idea kind of came from Hee Haw. It was like Grandpa Jones, and they would come out and say, hey, Grandpa, what's for supper? But we would have the kids come out and say, hey, long haul, what you hauling? And <laughs> it's just always like, I'm hauling pineapples. And then I would go into like, it's like some story about, fun fact story about pineapples and stuff. But I had written... Uh, uh, Don Kennedy into the show as Milkman Fred. <laughs> and it was just to get Don Kennedy in front of the camera again, uh, <laughs> dressed as a milkman, just making different recipes that heavily included dairy, just to make a mess on the stage. <laughs> and it was the funniest thing. And being like kind of as old as he was, he's kind of bitter about the French in World War II, I remember. Because <laughs> you would write him a simple phrase like he would you, he would finish making pudding, and I would write, and voila, yeah. pudding. And it was like a simple thing like that, and he would be like, I am not going to say that word. <laughs> what, <laughs> pudding? No, that French word. I'm not going to speak French. <laughs> he just was bitter about the French for some reason. That's amazing. Hey, you never know. It's like a, a bygone era. I guess. Voila. <laughs> I will not say voila. Yeah, he's like, no revealing in this. So, <laughs> no creme brulee for you, I guess. No <laughs> making of that. Was it that the French surrendered or something like that? I think that's it. If I recall from being Some a child when people World would say, yeah. Thing. yeah, they're like, oh, white flags. Oh, no, the, the French. The, yeah. White flags on the Champs-Élysées. <laughs> You're like, who cares? Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, would you not do the same thing? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the things I'm most intrigued about by your career is that what was cool to me about like the early Adult Swim and Cartoon Network era, especially, uh, so I'll be older than I want to admit to my audience this year, but like for me it was cool because I think I was at that prime age to watch kind of this changing of the guard from like the classic Hanna-Barbera era, which was really having a good resurgence when I was a kid in like the late 80s, early 90s, and then seeing what you all did and came in. Like, yeah, how much creative control did you get in those regards, you know, as far as like coming up with bits and uh, these shows? As far as like Adult Swim and stuff, mm -hmm. it was really, and Space Ghost, it was really difficult because we were working with Lazo, uh, and he was just... <laughs> he was not easy to work for sure and would get bored easily so if you like if you wrote like really a, a really funny line uh about you know a normal person if you read that funny line maybe the seventh time you're not gonna laugh at it because you know that the line is there right um but you know that it's still funny. Right. He's the type of person who would read it seven times and be like, that's not funny anymore. I'm not going to have that unfunny joke in the show. <laughs> and so uh, uh, the amount of really good joke materials and stuff that we had to, like, throw out was... Uh, but, you know, and then, you know, moving over to On Air and working on Fridays for different people yeah, <laughs> for a different person you know for pete johnson other than mike lazo yeah who actually understood comedy um i don't know if it was that we didn't have the luxury to like you know write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite but with pete if a joke didn't work you know it would be easy to change and we knew the joke didn't work and it would be funnier and anything you know can be funnier you know i i I get that. I understand it. Right. After a while, you have to think to yourself, I'm getting paid anyway. I don't care. I'm just going to make this funnier. <laughs> but um, with Fridays, it was different because, you know, you work with a different mindset and stuff. Plus, we had to have a new show every single Friday night for the entire year. So mm -hmm. um, I didn't even think about how much stressful that must have been. It wasn't that stressful because you're not writing a show. You're... You're going in on a weekend and shooting four shows, you know, okay. for the weekend. Yeah. Uh, and um, usually you're shooting, you know, ahead of time. So you're shooting Halloween stuff in August. You're shooting Christmas in October. Sure. And stuff. So, you know, and, and we weren't, like, writing a whole lot. We were writing maybe 15 to 20 minutes per uh, shoot. Uh, because it wrapped around like 30 minute cartoons. I 
had a couple interviews with WWE oh, okay. uh, a couple years ago. And there, uh, it, it was for WWE Raw to write for them. Oh, weird. Interesting. And their schedule is insane. Really? It's as if you, I likened it to Saturday Night Live. Only if you worked on Saturday Night Live and there was a show every single 52, you know, Saturdays a year. Yeah. And that's exactly what that is. WWE Raw wow. is a brand new show live every Monday night. And so the schedule for that, the pay was amazing. I'm sure. If I would have gotten that job. But the schedule would have been like, you don't have time for anything. Right. You're working on a new script every like Wednesday or Thursday. You finesse the script on a Friday and Saturday. Sunday, you go travel to the next venue. Monday, you shoot an entire two hour live show. <laughs> and then Tuesday, you go home and you do it all over again. Oh my gosh. And so it's like, and you're in a different city like every single week. So I, and would I they have had you traveling been, around? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. That's actually kind of interesting. That would have been great. It would have been great for, like, airline miles. I could have, you know, <laughs> on my free time if I had any, flew anywhere for free. Yeah, exactly. Imagine the hotels. That was, you know, one thing that was great about <clears throat> when I was married to uh, my wife, and she was a big Cartoon Network ex executive, is mm -hmm. that she would have to, like, go to California all the time out of Atlanta, and so we always had really good mileage points and hotel points to to be able to go, you know, wherever we wanted to. So, you know, we went to Germany like three times. We went to, uh, you know, France and Amsterdam and, wow, I've been everywhere. I love it. Prague. Yeah. I love Prague. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you had a favorite visit or spot. Um, no, I, th I've, I, I think Edinburgh was one of my favorites. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, and at some point, we were able to take uh, um, my daughter there. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, Germany, I love Germany. I love going to Germany. I, you know, I'm kind of mostly German. Uh, so <clears throat> just uh, being there, and uh, we would go around Thanksgiving for the Christmas markets because there was a time in our relationship <laughs> and family life where... For some reason, we would get deathly ill every Thanksgiving. <laughs> and I don't know if it was the bird or just the circumstance or something, but we were like, we are not spending Thanksgiving in America ever again. <laughs> so we would go to Germany and go to the Christmas markets, which was pretty amazing. I bet. I You know, and it's funny because we have a lot of German heritage here in Cincinnati, and mm -hmm. everybody's always excited about it. And I, I'm always curious to see, because I have family over in Germany as well, and I'm always thinking, like, are what, we do, are, are what we're doing here, is that even comparable to what I see over there? So No. Yeah, I figured No, I haven't found anything that's comparable there, although I wish I would have had time to do it. Maybe I'll go next year on my own, but um, last Christmas time... The beginning of the December was the big uh, Galaxy Con in in uh, in Columbus, and um, that's right. I got in there with uh, Dana Snyder, and one of the last nights I was like, "We got to go to Schmidt's," and uh, <laughs> Schmidt's is the big German restaurant. Yeah, in, in sausage Columbus. house, baby. And my dad grew up in in German Village, so oh, cool. Know, we knew of Schmidt's all the time. And, um, so we were like bound in turn. We're going to Schmidt's tonight. And so uh, I ventured out <laughs> to go to Schmidt's, and it was just wall to wall people. And I could tell there were little kiosks set up and yeah. stuff. I thought, oh, we're not getting into Schmidt's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up at Dirty Dogs, which was pretty dirty. Or Dirty Franks. Dirty Franks. Yes. We ended up at Dirty Franks, which was amazing. Oh, Dirty Franks is great. But uh, yeah. Schmitz is on our on, on our list next year. Hey, let's make that um, happen. You know, a uh, fun fact: we actually carry their sausages here in store. So I like the you know the Bahama Mama, the Bahama Mama classic. Bahama Mama. Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I remember going to Schmitz a lot when I was a kid, and going over to Schmitz Sausage House. That was the first time I ever encountered gummy bears. Really? 
Yeah, I, I don't. They weren't sold. I mean, this was the. I don't think we're that this, different this in age, like are we? Seventies. I'm okay. fifty six. Okay, so so this a is gap, like but... the seventies, uh, before like they prepackaged like that makes sense. And, and shit. So wow, that's crazy. I didn't even. I mean, oh yeah, one of those things so, you just don't think about. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know my the fudge and the gummy bears and the. At first, when I, I think I had a gummy bear, I thought it would be like, because my grandma, my dad's mom, always had those like uh, orange slices. Yeah. I always thought they would be kind of like those gumdroppy type of texture, but it yeah. was like, like, this is like a rubber band. <laughs> <laughs> a delicious rubber band. D- did your daughter get the, uh, the creative bug? She, uh, sh- she did. I don't. I, st- I still don't know if she knows what she wants to do. Uh, for that makes the longest two of us. time, it's like, I want to be a fashion designer. And then um, I wish I would have had her do more. I wish I would have been in the place to have her do more voice work because I had her be um, in 2012 for the 20th anniversary of the network. We brought back Cartoon Planet for yeah. a little bit. And. Um, uh, we did new stuff. Space Ghost wasn't in it. It was just like Zorak and Brack stuck in a one-bedroom apartment. That's <laughs> <laughs> basically <laughs> what the sets look like. Uh, <clears throat> so we put them on new sets. So Brack's basically standing, basically sitting at the at the bar, at the kitchen, uh, in the apartment, and then off. To the side is Zorak sitting in a beanbag chair. So we had to do new drawings of Zorak with his oh, legs yeah. crossed sitting in a beanbag chair. <laughs> and he's just playing, you know, an Xbox or a PlayStation the whole time. And while Brack is sitting at this counter with, like, a cup of hot dogs, <laughs> just stupid stuff around, there's a nameplate that says Steve Delmonico. And that's a joke for the Brack show. For when we had George Takei on, and his uh, his agent got really insanely mad at us <clears throat> for having, because he he acted like we tricked George Takei to be on the show <laughs> because the show wasn't union. So his agent just went completely crazy over us and said, "You're not going to use his name in the credits." And so his name in the credits is Steve Delmonico. So oh. if you ever see any of that. It's on YouTube, some of the old, some of the newer Cartoon Planet stuff. But I brought my daughter in to record because I did a few segments of Brack. First of all, Brack is just kind of giggling to himself, and Zorak's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I made clones of it. And so I bring in this <laughs> tiny one-third size Brack and, uh, and then later bring in this tiny little Zorak and at some point at the very end I have a joke of like space little space ghost popping him his head up out of the cup or something like that so I had my daughter she was six years old at the time come in and be Brack and Zorak and space ghost oh that's um, adorable I had a theme song it was like hello everybody hello everybody and so I had her sing that and then I started playing basically that tune again and had her sing <laughs> Whatever she liked. So that one is definitely on YouTube of her going, I like gay pickles. I like gay pickles. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm sitting there in the booth with her the whole time, and she's doing, like, dead-on impressions of Brack and Zorak, which was... Oh, that's so cool. And I, I wish I would have had her do more VO work after that. Hey, there's still time. Yeah, there is. You know. She's, like, heavily into cheerleading and stuff like that. Oh, cool. Her. Yeah. I was, you know, I, I always am curious too, because I had like the, op- I'm like from, I, there's definitely some creative relatives in the blo- in the house, right. but like not in my immediate family. Like my dad, it's like, it's funny if you met him, like we have very similar personalities, but he's like very much old school businessman. So I'm always like, how the hell did I show up? You know? My dad was always a really funny person. Um, and my dad was a dentist and my mom was a was the hygienist and so they had a practice together oh that's cool and uh but my dad was always art artistic and and it was really really funny 
and stuff. So I get a lot of that from him. And when I started, basically my whole entertainment career started uh, doing a puppet ministry with my family growing up. Yeah. And so usually my brother and I were, you know, the funny puppets and my mom would be out front being the straight guy. And every once in a while, my dad would like put on a puppet and bring him out and just stupid. It was just so really so funny. And um, so, you know, just I, I, I acquire, I, you know, I attribute all of my humor to, to him. Um, I mean, I had comic influences, but my dad was, he was always very supportive of, you know, everything I did. So, you know, once I started doing the Cartoon Planet stuff and stuff, yeah. he was, you know, never more proud um, of, of me than at that, at that point, you know. Yeah. Well, I imagine for um, them, they, like, watched you as a kid doing this thing, and then you're like, look, guys, I made this. This is my life now. Right. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, they always I, – I was going to be a pharmacist, Um I had to give up like theater and 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 all of that stuff, and I went to Ohio Northern University to be a pharmacist, and I left to go back to uh, work to to go to my brother's college, Asbury in Kentucky, because my grades were so bad <laughs> at Ohio Northern. But the only the only thing I did really well at at Ohio Northern was like creative writing, and so um, it took me a while to to realize that's what I really wanted to do because yeah. I thought, you know, everybody had to have a professional uh, job, which <laughs> looking back now, it would have been great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I went into psychology uh, after that, but then they had a really good TV and radio program at sure. Asbury. And so um, that's, you know, what I went for. So I was in once I got to Asbury, I was in all the plays and musicals and um, did a lot of, I excelled at, at uh, you know, just majoring in broadcasting and, and doing like TV classes and acting classes and stuff like that. Once I got to Asbury, I never, ever in my entire college career ever had to take science or math again. I... The, it was really nice to hear some, I, like literally, Andy, I joke all the time. The only reason I got into this line of work is because there was only one math class requirement and it was math for liberal arts students. And uh -huh. I had to count rings on a pineapple. That was like the final exam. It was I incredible. Took calculus. <laughs> I took calculus twice <laughs> because I did so bad the first time around. Uh, I was never good at biology. Uh, I thought pharmacy would be great because I was really good at math and uh, chemistry in, in high school. I thought that's basically all it was, but nope. Whole new world. Too much. Uh, <laughs> too many of the uh, professorial staff at Ohio Northern uh, during the midterm and the final exams coming together to make this these blitzkrieg of a test to like <laughs> really uh all of the tests were multiple choice and every single every single choice was you make the most minute little <laughs> mathematical <laughs> screw up and there's the answer right there so <laughs> you leave the test going i think i did great but you nope did you show your work <laughs> i would show my work and then i would get I would, I think my first, uh, I think it was my first chemistry midterm. I had a, why don't you come see me <laughs> note <laughs> on it. I thought, what? Would you have any advice for somebody that's trying to get into this line of work? That's what maybe they're I, watching that's right hard. now. No, but, but that's the hard question because, you know, and especially a more interesting answer if I'm sitting here with, you know, Dana. Yeah. Snyder or well, Dana, come on. Anybody, anybody <laughs> like that? Because Dana, it it doesn't matter. There's just so many different ways to fall into this yeah. that it's there's no true path. Uh, Dana was in theater, and so was Carrie Means, and um, I don't I don't know if it was 
something that Dave Willis had seen or, or something like that, that, that Dana was in that, you know, he discovered him. But, you know, I hired Dave Willis kind of basically almost out of college. Oh, no um, kidding. I didn't know that. And Dave and I kind of have similar ways of going at it, and that's basically create your show <laughs> right? and uh, be in the writer's room. Uh, cause that's basically what it was, was, uh, me reading Brack for the 12 days of Christmas from the council of doom yep. in the writer's room and them saying, you know, I like that. And so that's, you know, and, and not having the budget to, to hire a professional voice was basically, you know, how I got into doing it. Cause you know, I did it for free for forever and especially right. like. When I did, I redid Cartoon Planet in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, we could only have Zorak because that's all we could afford. Sure. Uh, if I would have had just a slightly bigger budget, we could have had George come in and be Space Ghost. But right. uh, the only VO we paid for when we redid that was was for was for Clay to come in and be Zorak, which. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was my call because I thought it would be more interesting to have Zorak and Brat go at it. Yeah. Um, and it was also a good call because it was the last time I got to work with Clay, and, and uh, that was bittersweet. It's it's hard to say how to get into this business uh, other than either those two ways, be discovered, right. uh, be there, or just be just – have a unique voice and be just diligent as hell. Cause I don't, you know, you have to really believe in what you're doing to do it. And I don't, and it, it's not like we're making, you know, billions of dollars, you know, we're not, you know, John DiMaggio or, sure. or uh, Tom Kenny. Right. We all wish we were, but For sure. You know, but we're not. So, you know, there's there's a few that <clears throat> have like really broken out and really do really really well. Yeah, and it's like voices you can name; those are the people. Right. You touch on something that I think is the real piece of advice, though, which is the you talk about just diligence, right? And like diving in because I think the one through line I always find, and I mean, I can speak to it from my own career a little bit. Obviously, not again, not on the same level by any means, but like. Same thing where it was just like, just go. I, honestly, you touched on all of them. But it's like, say yes, show up, and work really hard on this thing that you believe in that you can do. Right. You know, and it's yeah. no guarantee, but it's going to be the thing that separates you from maybe getting there versus definitely not getting there. Do you know? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, in early at Cartoon Network, when I was working on Space Ghost and stuff, uh, they had paired me with um, Dwayne McDuffie. Oh, yeah. Um, Amazing to do, yeah, to to do uh, an Inferior Five cartoon. What for DC and Warner Brothers? Oh, that would have been so cool. And we had gotten really, really far in the whole development process, and it was, you know, it was going to be amazing. And we had to tweak things here and there. There was a <clears throat> basically the the show would have been about the outcast, stupid. Uh, um, offspring of if the Justice League had gotten together and mated <laughs> and aged out of their <laughs> term in the Justice League. So the Inferior <laughs> Five was going to take over for their parents. We got to the point where we were finally talking to, I think, Dan DiDio. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, it got to the point where we got to him and he was in charge of the action cartoons at the time. Yeah. And um, and it was as if the project had never existed. It just completely fell apart and died right there. No kidding. And that was like that was the meeting that would have been like where we would have really started production after that meeting. And you know, Sam registers there going, "I don't know what happened. I don't know what's going on." <laughs> I can't even imagine. And. Uh, and even Dwayne like called me afterwards saying, I have never experienced anything like that before. <laughs> I thought, okay, I guess it's 
bad luck for me. <laughs> but no, it was it was uh, pretty amazing uh, working working with with uh, Dwayne for at least that you know eight month ten month period of time. Uh, I bet I feel like the, oh my gosh, I feel like we could do like a whole day of content just be like all right, what other shows have you seen fall apart like that? Because I feel like people don't recognize how often that happens. Just that one, but that was the biggest. Uh, I think that was the biggest person I'd ever been put with. Yeah. Um, That's still so cool, though. and got to be an honor to at least be in the room for that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I never got to meet him, like, face-to-face, -face, but we just talked on the phone all the time. That's so cool. Um, the most DC character I wrote for was I, I did a, uh, an issue of Superman Adventure comics, and it was based on the cartoon, and I... I had this Superman encyclopedia from when I was a kid. Yeah. And I brought back these two characters from the 40s. I can't remember who they – I can't remember their names, but they were kind of like an Abbott and Costello. Oh, okay. Yeah. Type of uh, – and, and the way they were drawn – Back then, it, it looked like Robert Clampett had, okay. had, had drawn them. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> they were just this magician duo. And um, basically, this miraculous stuff they did just happened by circumstance of <laughs> being where they were. And so my whole story was, it was a two-parter. It was all like, first shown from the audience perspective of watching their magic show. Yeah. And so they, they're doing all these amazing pulling flowers out of thin air and doing all this amazing magician work and stuff. And then I did a second version that's told from the, the uh, perspective of Superman who is fighting the uh, parasite. Yeah. So everything that, is going on is just a pure coincidence with their <laughs> magic show. So, uh, you know, when they pull flowers out of thin air, it just happens that a flower cart had been pulled up by <laughs> the, the parasite and flowers had fallen out and he just actually, actually just kind of happened to catch them at, this, at the, the right time. Perfect timing, I love like it. That. So uh, it was all cause and effect. Um, so that's that was my little uh, Superman adventures. Story. Oh, that's so cool! Um, I didn't even realize. I love it. it went like full Rashomon on it. Like, let's get all the perspectives. And then I wrote I wrote uh, a story in both of the the uh, Bizarro comics. Oh, yeah. Where they had independent writers and independent artists come together and do stories. The the first one, the Bizarro uh, collection that had uh, Matt Groening had uh, drew a picture of Bizarro blowing through a bubble pipe on the cover. That one, I did an Aquaman story. <laughs> it's basically told the pers from the perspective of a uh, Fisher-Price little people person <laughs> in a four-year-old's bathtub. And so every single character is held by these tiny hands going, I'm going to get you, blah, blah, blah. And, and then the, the sequel to that uh, collection like Bizarro 2 or something like that. It's all like one collection digitally now on uh, on uh, Comixology or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but the other one I did was I always had this, trying to pitch this story of, it was like an amalgam of of uh, Rankin Bass's Santa Claus is Coming to Town okay. with the uh, origin of Superman. And so, uh, but... I only had six pages. Okay. So I wrote it as if it was Twas the Night Before Christmas. So I wrote it all <laughs> as a poem. Um, so, yeah. It's, oh, I got to check that out. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, Kal El uh, crash lands in the North Pole. He's found <laughs> by elves. He's raised by the Kringle family. And that's why he's so good and nice. And um, he's able to go to every house. Uh, <laughs> At Christmas time, because you know he's Superman. Um, that makes sense. So yeah, it fixes all the Christmas lore that we didn't know. <laughs> I I didn't. What I really wanted to do is, if I would have had a longer amount of time to tell the story, I would have introduced uh, Luthor as you know uh, uh, 
Burger Meister. Meister, Meister Burger. And, uh, <laughs> uh, also, also, yeah, that. Um, but um, um, now I want but, yeah. this as a stop motion story. Like, I want this full rank and bass style. I know. I know. Somebody needs to bring that back in a big way. I think they've tried, and they've tried to do uh, sequels to Year Without a Santa Claus and stuff and make it look like stop motion, and it just yeah. hasn't worked because, I don't know, the, the, they've made it, they made it too kiddie, I think. Yeah. Um, There's just, every so often I get lost in nostalgia in those eras. I always think back to how different – I feel like these days when we do kind of like years later sequels, like the, the landscape of media has changed a lot, obviously. Right. And to me, there's like less intent. Like I find this is so nerdy. I can't believe I'm admitting this in public, but I will, when I'm trying to get into the holiday spirit, for example, I will dive into old commercials that aired in like the seventies, eighties stuff that I saw when I was a little kid. Right. And even looking at obvious advertisements, right? Like they definitely want you to buy their products versus how ads work now. Right. There's like, they felt like there was like a little more warmth or emotion or something. You know what I mean? Like, well, I don't you know. You would never see Santa sledding on a razor anymore. Right. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's the only way he should travel. Norelka, what's up? But you know, you know, like shows like year without a Santa Claus always, always, drives me crazy once once I found this one flaw. In oh, it. I can't wait. And they could easily they could easily fix it with like a cutaway or something like that. But there's a point in the story where Mother Nature is telling Heat and uh Snow Miser to uh let it snow. You let it snow in South Town, right. and you let there be a nice, hot, sunny day in the North Pole. She points at the wrong miser. She's oh. like, you let it snow in South Town, <laughs> and she's pointing at snow miser. And then she turns to heat miser and say, you let it have be a nice, sunny day in, in the North Pole. And that drives me crazy. Oh, I think you just broke a year without a Santa Claus for me. And maybe all of us watching. And you'll, you'll not be able to unsee it. Oh, yeah. I can't even imagine. Oh, that's... So the one for me, I was like a Rudolph kid, right? And my, my first attempt at doing voices was learning all of the voices in that show and then performing them. My mom will be so happy if she listens to this episode <laughs> that I'm admitting this publicly. But... uh yeah, loved that I would just do all of the characters. And it's like a running joke in the family still, you know, I'm in my late 30s now doing, you know, <laughs> Lando and all that, you know, like go full you. I wonder if I could still do that. To, I memorized Breakfast Club in college. Did you really? Mole really pumps my nads. <laughs> it's Moliere. Do -do -do. Um, <laughs> I can see quoting... Uh, Rudolph the entire show. It's, I'm sure, incredibly frustrating to watch it with me. <laughs> Except the part that they cut out at the end. Oh, with the peppermint mines? The peppermint mines. Also, did you memorize the song, uh, the Misfit song or the Fame and Fortune? So song? growing up, it was Fame and Fortune. And then when they restored it and whatever in the, the mid 90s, I was like, oh, we got another a reprise of the Misfits tune, you know? The weird thing is that they made fame and fortune work edit wise so yeah once they went back to the original misfit song it didn't work animation wise yeah. anymore because they screwed it up in the editing it's such a, it's a strange thing too and it's that one it's you know that's like one of those pieces of lost me i'm sure if i just haven't googled it well enough but it is one of those things i think about every christmas i was like whatever happened to fame and fortune it's like they never it's never shows up on any of the re-releases re this whole episode now should just be about rank that's and just, bass yeah i know <laughs> i saw mad monster that, parties getting a re-release that seems like it's victim of some uh some Network executive going, that's, you know, there's too much misfits. It's too depressing. Yeah. 
Well, and, and that, by the way, goes back to my original point about the the years later sequels, right? Where a lot of the modern stuff, to me, always misses that magic where I feel like the reason a lot of those old Rankin Bass things worked is that it was clearly a creative endeavor by passionate people that I think maybe because the industry was so different back then, they didn't have as many, like, hands, you know what I mean? Like, cooks in the kitchen going, no. Or can you add, can we do a little more of this? Can we aim more at this yeah, quadrant? Can we make it happier? Can we, yeah. Yeah, whereas I'm sure back there. people to go, no, screw you. Yeah. Well, and I guess there's that famous, famous well, anecdote there, about it. Well, there's also uh, the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Yeah. For years, they cut out, you know, someday soon we'll have to meddle through somehow. That line Interesting. was replaced by Hang a Shining Star Upon the Highest Bow. Um, huh. Just to make the song less depressing, right? Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of people who record that song now put "Muddle Through" back in because <laughs> for entire time, yeah, right. <laughs> like we're living through the end. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny that I and now that I said that about Rudolph too, because they added the extra scene after the first airing where they go back for the Misfit Toys. That was like a that was a year later they added that whole scene and where the Misfit Toys are on the island at the end and Santa shows up to save them, right? Yeah, because like kids were writing in like, well, what happened to them? Yeah, I mean. But they still don't air the, they still don't air the full version where yeah. you see that Rudolph's family, his father is finally proud of him. Yep. And then you see what Yukon has been looking for the entire episode. Yeah. I remember and why he thinking. like licks the. <laughs> Why is he licking that for gold? He's not looking for gold. He's looking for the peppermint mine. He's just been lying the whole time. It's at the very end of the show that you cut out. (laughs) Yeah, conveniently at Santa's, in Santa's backyard. (sighs) (laughs) Andy, this has been an absolute pleasure today. I'm so glad you came down. I'm a wealth of stupid knowledge. Uh, I did want to ask. I mean, I know we talked about a couple things coming down the pipeline for you. Is there, is there anything uh, you're particularly excited about? Or is, um, is this where, can I plead to Dave Willis to bring you back in the Aqua Teen oh reboot God. that I keep hearing about? Yeah, it would be fun to do more uh, Aqua Teen, but that's that's up to them. Um, uh, I, I don't, you know. Anyway, uh, I just recorded yesterday for Disney's Kiff Cool. Uh, that started about a month ago. Yeah. Um, it, the episode's already storyboarded, so I don't I don't know how soon that will um, be out. Just playing dumb songs on the ukulele and trying to stay relevant. Well, that was a wild ride. A little disjointed, right? We're all over the place. You get a couple of creative ADHD types in the room together and go, hey, you know, we both have dark hair and beards. We could be related now. <laughs> Andy, I really appreciate it, man. Anytime you're here, I'd love to take care of you guys. Sorry to miss you the last time you guys were in the store. Um, but it was an honor. I'm so thankful you came on here. So look, we got Andy. Next up, who we got to get? Uh, maybe Dave Willis, Dana Snyder, any of the D-named people at <laughs> Adult Swim. Uh, and you know what? Let me give one more shout out. I want to give a shout out to my friend Ronnie, who runs the Dancing is Forbidden podcast. It's an Aqua Teen Hunger Force fan podcast. This all came together because Ronnie got me connected with Andy. He was like, hey, I'm pretty sure Andy Merrill's in your store right now. Uh, something along those lines. Anyway, Ronnie's been really cool. His show's great. If you love Aqua Teen, uh, Ronnie's become really tight with a lot of the people, like the aforementioned Dave Willis. Uh, and it's been really fun to see his show grow and the and just the excitement around what he's doing. And of course, it's really refreshing when you meet somebody like that that's having that kind of success and still thinks about other people. So truly, Ronnie, you're a great guy. I appreciate this connection. Thanks so much for providing me this cool opportunity uh, and all that good stuff. So if you like Aqua Teen, check out his show, Dancing is Forbidden. All right, I'm out of here for now. I've got some toys on the desk. I've got some fun stuff. Actually, here, I'll sneak this in. I made a candle and you all get to see me watch, you all get to watch me do that on the show soon. Stay tuned. There's so much fun. I've got that coming up. I've got the band Green Jello was here. Oh my gosh, that is taking me a while to edit because we were all absolutely unhinged and I'm really excited about that. Bill Manspeaker, you're a total gem. Very excited about it. Uh, more toy content. Look, I got Beavis a butthead on the table. It's a good week. Anyway, on that, thank you all so much for lo- tuning in, <laughs> looting in, listening and tuning in. That's right. Uh, I really appreciate the sport. Thanks for everything. Thanks to WCPO for having me on this week on the show. Oh my gosh, there's like so many things. I appreciate it to everybody who's been really supporting me lately. It's been very cool. Uh, and on that, I'm going to do some shopping. So I'll see you out there in the aisles.
The Jungle Gyms podcast is recorded in the WJJI studio inside Jungle Gyms International Market in Fairfield, Ohio. The Jungle Gyms podcast is produced and hosted by Mark Borison.